So in the last video, we talked about Bloch's theorem, and we sketched out a, a rough proof of it. Um, but in this video, I want to explore it a little bit more. So in the last video, we talked about how if you had this chain of atoms that went on forever, um, and you were just walking along this chain, so you were just walking along this chain of atoms, you would have no way of knowing where you were in this, in this weird world. Uh, whether you're at this atom or the next atom or the next atom, uh, because to you, all you see is an infinite chain of either atoms on either side. And so it doesn't really matter where you are in this system. But we could make the same exact symmetry argument for just a world that doesn't have any atoms in it. So just for, let's say, a continuous line. So you're just in a universe uh, or a along a line with nothing in it. Uh, this is also known as free space. And in this case, uh, you similarly wouldn't know where you are. But uh, here, you wouldn't know where you are, whether you were standing here, whether you were standing a couple meters to the left, uh, here, 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 anywhere. Uh, or if you, uh, we just replace you with the wave function or the wave function's probability, and let's call this particular point x, uh, there's no reason why the probability should be different at x, so why psi of x magnitude squared should be any different than at any other distance. So we would expect the probability to be equal to, say, uh, psi of x plus, I don't know, epsilon uh, squared. So if we take some tiny step to the right, uh, so this point would be x plus epsilon, we have no reason to suspect that the probability will be different because this is a continuously symmetric universe. So it's continuously symmetric. No point is different from any other point. And so uh, in general, we can say that psi of x plus epsilon uh, should equal some coefficient, which has magnitude of 1, uh, times psi of x. So just to write that down, c should have magnitude equal to 1. But now we can do the same, ex we can make the same exact argument that we made in the last video. We can say, well, what if I constructed a ring out of this world? Or what if I constructed a circle? Uh, because if I make this circle big enough, so I, I make this circle large enough, it's not going to be distinguishable from a line, at least, uh, at least locally. And this is also known as imposing periodic boundary conditions, periodic boundary conditions on our universe. And again, uh, just as in the last video, it's clearly nonsensical because if you walk off one edge of the universe, uh, you come back to the other edge. But if this circle is large enough, uh, you'll never have enough time to get to the edge. So it's really not a, not a problem unless you're worried about the finite extent of the universe that you're dealing with. So if we've got a block of semiconductor, for example, or a block of space, uh, this is going to be inaccurate near the edges, but it's probably going to be a great approximation near the middle. And so with these periodic boundary conditions, uh, we can do exactly what we did in the last video. Let's just take a bunch of steps around this circle. So let's say that we're at point x, uh, and we take a bunch of steps of distance epsilon, so the steps, the distance of these steps is epsilon. And we keep going, we keep going, we keep going, we keep going, we keep going until we go back to our original, uh, our original position. And each time, so this would be uh, x plus epsilon. Each time we do that, our wave function gets multiplied by a constant. So uh, psi of x plus epsilon should equal c times psi of x. And similarly, psi of x plus 2 epsilon, well, we just multiply a c by the previous result, c squared psi of x, and so on and so on. And uh, when we eventually come around our entire universe, or we take enough steps to get back to where we were before, we've got psi of x plus n epsilon uh, should just equal c to the n times psi of x. And from the condition that we specified above, we can just get that c to the n, uh, its magnitude has to be equal to 1, or c has to be an nth root of unity. 
So just as in the last video, it just has to equal e to the i 2 pi times some integer uh, divided by n. Uh, but really, we haven't said what this n is, uh, or and we also haven't said what this epsilon is. And epsilon can be as small as we want. Uh, epsilon can be as small as we want, because this is a continuously symmetric system. And so if we take the limit uh, as epsilon approaches zero, so the limit uh, as epsilon approaches zero, then we have, uh, instead of an integer multiple of two pi, so e to the j or e to the i two pi s over n, we have any continuous value. Uh, let's call it e to the i k uh, epsilon. And this notation, we haven't said what k is, but k has units of inverse length. Um, and this notation is just to show that since epsilon can be as close to zero as we want, this argument uh, for this complex exponential can also be as close to zero as we want. And this can really take any value. And so what wave function, uh, when you plug in x plus epsilon, gives you the original wave function times e to the i k epsilon? Uh, well, that's just e to the i k x. So when you plug in x is equal to epsilon, uh, that gives you e to the i k x plus epsilon, which is equal to e to the i k epsilon times e to the i k x. And this was our original wave function. This is what we were looking for. And so we know that psi of x now is going to be of the form e to the i k x. But is that the only thing that it could be? So uh, is there anything else we can do to this psi of x to make this more general? Uh, and the answer is that we could also scale it by a constant. So we could also put some s number c out front uh, because c times e to the i k x, or let's plug in x plus epsilon, uh, is still equal to c e to the i k x times e to the i k epsilon. And so this was our original wave function. This is our original wave function uh, with, with just the x, not the epsilon. And so in general, we can scale by a coefficient c as well. Uh, and maybe c is a function of k. Uh, so let's just say, in general, psi of x is equal to c sub k times e to the e uh, to the i k x. Now, do you recognize this, this notation? What if I put a sum out front, sum over all k? Do you recognize this? Um, because this is nothing but a Fourier series. Because we found one solution to the Schrodinger equation. So we found one solution to the Schrodinger equation. But if I have a bunch of different k's, those all solve the Schrodinger equation. And so a sum of these solutions is also a solution to the Schrodinger equation. And this shouldn't be too surprising, uh, even though it is really, really cool, uh, because we imposed periodic boundary conditions uh, on our universe. In other words, we ensured uh, that psi of x had to be a periodic function. So psi of x has to be... Oops, uh, psi of s has to be periodic, um, but the periodicity is sort of of the entire universe, so that, that makes this a little weird. But Fourier's theorem says that any function f of x, which is periodic, can just be represented using a Fourier series. Uh, and if we want to represent something aperiodic, so we want to take our universe to be actually infinite, uh, then this sum becomes an integral uh, so c becomes a function of k, e to the i k x, dk. And so this is psi of x. And this has deep implications far beyond the scope of this video. Uh, but what we found here is that Bloch's theorem, uh, so Bloch's theorem appears to just be a more general case of Fourier's theorem. Of Fourier's theorem. Although Bloch's theorem is generally more useful when we have true periodic structures like lattices, uh, and Fourier's theorem is much more useful in uh, areas like free space where the wave function can propagate as it pleases. And in continuous free space, we actually want to use a Fourier transform. But in a sort of ring universe, uh, one that's finite and periodic, 
we can actually use a real real live Fourier series. And so this CK, uh, these Fourier coefficients are analogous to this UK, uh, this periodic function, which is a function of X. In fact, UK actually becomes CK uh, in the limit as the lattice spacing approaches zero. So we can think of Fourier's theorem as actually a special case of Bloch's theorem, if you like. Uh, in taking a limit as a approaches zero, where a is the lattice constant between two atoms. So I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give it a like below and subscribe to my channel. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, also please feel free to post those down below and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. And thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.